Hello everybody and welcome to the MMA Training Bible's Guide to Muscle Contraction. I'm Dr. Jason Gillis. Now in this video we're going to be talking specifically about muscle contraction. It's important to know this stuff because if you understand the, the basic physiology and anatomy of how your muscles contract, you'll understand a little bit more about how your body responds to a particular type of training program. I hope that you'll be able to maybe better choose particular types of training programs. Uh, and not only that, I think with this general knowledge, you should be able to better evaluate articles or, or things that you read online because there's a lot of good stuff, but there's also a lot of bad stuff out there as well. So I'm hoping that this uh, video and the others like it will empower you a little bit to try to take a hold of this confusing area and, and really, really try to create the best program for yourself. Okay, so let's get into it. We want to cover two things in this video. The first one is we want to talk about muscle activation, how muscles are actually activated. The next thing we want to focus on is muscle contraction and this can be a little confusing. I teach this a lot to students and really this is one of the biggest stumbling blocks and it's because a lot of those structures that you saw in the last video and a lot of the structures we deal with in this one, they're microscopic and they're really hard to visualize. So what we want to try to do is you want to try to draw some pictures in this video and hopefully you'll be drawing along and we'll try to figure out how these structures work together to contract, how these structures work together to lengthen or shorten a muscle. And there's really one process that we want to try to focus on in this video. It's, it's called excitation contraction coupling. And we're going to try to break that down in six steps. So after you go through this video, I hope that you have a good understanding of how muscles create movement. So first, th first things first, let's talk about how muscles are activated. Muscles are activated by neurons. Specifically, they're going to be activated by a big neuron called an alpha motor neuron. Now, you're gonna have neurons that go from your brain to your spinal cord and then reach out from your spinal cord to your muscles. We're talking about those last neurons and they're called alpha motor neurons. Now, there's another structure that I, I want you to be aware of when we're talking about this. And we have the neuron and then we have the muscle, but there is a space between the neuron and the muscle. It's called the neuromuscular junction, that whole area. And there's a lot of important stuff that happens. And that area in particular between the neuron and the muscle, it's called the synaptic cleft. And that's gonna come up later on. But I want you to appreciate that the neuron is, it's not physically connected to the muscle. There's actually a little bit of a space there. And if we wanna communicate from the neuron to the muscle, we're going to have to bridge that gap somehow. And we'll talk later on about exactly how we do that. Now, as I said, muscle fibers, they communicate with neurons. When you take the neuron and you add the different muscle fibers to that neuron, that whole thing is referred to as a motor unit. Now, all motor units are not created equal. You have big motor units and you have small motor units. And the differences between those, well, there's a whole bunch, but basically, if a small motor unit is going to be attached to fewer muscle fibers and it's probably gonna be a little bit more narrow in diameter, the neuron itself. A big motor unit, it's going to be bigger in diameter, and it's also going to be attached to many more muscle fibers. Basically, how this influences you and how it influences performance is the bigger motor units that you're able to recruit, the more force that you're able to generate. If you're recruiting small motor units, then uh, you're not going to be able to generate much force. But more is not always better. For example, you want to be able to use small motor units when you're trying to write or when you're trying to type or when you're trying to, to perform uh, very precise tasks. And you want to use very big motor units when you're trying to generate a lot of force like a takedown in the, in, in the cage. Okay, so enough talk about this stuff. I want to draw you a picture. And if you have a piece of paper, if you have a pencil, I suggest you get it and you draw along because this is really a good way to try to learn this stuff. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to draw a motor unit. So hopefully you'll, you'll get a better idea of what we're talking about. Okay, so let's draw that motor unit now. Uh, first thing we want to draw is the cell body uh, of a neuron. So we're drawing the cell body of a neuron. I know this is maybe going to look a little bit weird if you haven't seen this sort of thing before. But let's continue on. Let's see if, if you can draw it 
uh, in a similar way that I'm drawing it. And we'll, we'll try to describe some of these structures as we, as we go. Okay, so what we're drawing here is this is uh, an alpha motor neuron and what we're particularly looking at here is the cell body of the alpha motor neuron and this particular thing right here that's the nucleus of the neuron and then we have this structure the axon we call it which ultimately reaches out and it, that's going to be communicating with muscle fibers now there are sheets of myelin that are stretched along this neuron. These sheets of myelin allow very fast communication from one end to the neuron to the other. And the direction of information travel on this neuron it starts up here and then it goes down that way. Uh, incidentally, uh, if we're talking about pathologies, then uh, multiple sclerosis attacks these myelin sheaths and that can inf interfere with uh, neural communication from one place to another. So uh, I'm going to move this down a little bit here so we can get the full, get the full view here. Okay. All right, let's continue drawing. Now, these neurons, this alpha motor neuron, as we said, it's going to be attached to uh, muscle fibers. So let's, let's draw in some muscle fibers right here. Make sure we know exactly what we're looking at. So these are our little muscle fibers. Now, if you recall back to the previous video that we watched, muscle fibers are made up of many smaller units inside, uh, and these smaller units are called myofibrils. It's important that you know what they are because we're gonna be really getting down into these, these muscle fibers, whoops, uh, later on. Now, um, what I wanna focus on here is this neuron, it's going to be um, communicating with each of these muscle fibers in a very precise way. Now, what we're really talking about here and where we're gonna get into is there's this little area at the end. Uh, it's called the axon terminal. And this axon terminal is really going to be uh, in very close proximity to the muscle fiber, but it doesn't touch. So. Uh, just to summarize here, we have uh, the cell body, and then we have the axon, uh, the axon of the, the neuron, and then we have muscle fibers that it attaches to. And this whole thing, it's called a motor, a motor unit. Okay. Let's get back to that presentation and continue on. So, we talked about how muscles uh, are activated and now we know that muscles are activated by neurons. The next thing that we want to focus on is how do muscles contract? And as I mentioned before, this is really a process called excitation contraction coupling. And we're going to try to break it down into six different steps in this video to try to make them nice and easy for you to get. The first step is, we've already mentioned it, it's an action potential that starts in the brain. Maybe you want to punch someone in the face. So that action potential moves away from the brain and down the spinal cord, and then it moves down the alpha motor neuron, and then all the way down to the end of that neuron to the axon terminal. Remember, that axon terminal is in close proximity to the muscle, but it doesn't touch. So that action potential is going to be moving down that axon terminal, and in the axon terminal, we have little vesicles that hold a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine. Acetylcholine, in response to receiving an action potential at the end of that terminal, will be released into this space between the neuron and the muscle, which is called the synapse or the synaptic cleft. The acetylcholine will then bind to acetylcholine receptors on the plasma lemma. Now the plasma lemma is just another name for the cell membrane of the muscle fiber. What happens is that cell membrane will then depolarize as those acetylcholine receptors are activated on that membrane. And as a result of that depolarization, another action potential will be generated. And that action potential will spread along the T-tubules, remember those structures, which carry the action potential deep inside that muscle fiber. And those T-tubules are connected to the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Now, the sarcoplasmic reticulum stores calcium. So when that action potential travels down the T-tubules and 
uh, signals the, the sarcoplasmic reticulum to release calcium, that calcium will then uh, leave the sarcoplasmic reticulum and it would bathe all of those myofibrils that make up that muscle fiber. And it's this calcium that leaves the sarcoplasmic reticulum which ultimately allows myosin to bind to actin. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that process, but ultimately it's calcium that's, uh, that's causing muscle contraction. I can't overemphasize the point enough that calcium is really important in muscle contraction. So I just wanna try to reiterate that point again, just a little bit. So we've got this action potential that arrives at the sarcoplasmic reticulum from the T-tubules. The sarcoplasmic reticulum is very sensitive to electrical charge and it's really going to cause this very large release of calcium into the sarcoplasm. Now the sarcoplasm, it's a cytoplasm or you could think of it as that space between all those individual myofibrils inside the muscle cell. Calcium then is going to bind with troponin on the thin filament of actin and when calcium binds with troponin it's also attached to tropomyosin and it will pull tropomyosin away from actin and it will expose a binding site on actin in which myosin can then bind to. And then myosin will bind to actin and this allows contraction to occur. Okay, let's draw a picture. So uh, if you're drawing along, make sure you, you get out a piece of paper and draw with us. Okay, let's start by drawing the axon terminal of a neuron, maybe an alpha motor neuron. So this is that, that axon terminal, which uh, is the end of a neuron. Now let's also draw the membrane of a muscle fiber. And remember, we said that they don't connect. They're not, it's not a physical connection. So we've got this end of the neuron, it's called the axon terminal. And if you remember, we have a whole bunch of vesicles inside that axon terminal. And do you remember what's contained within those vessels? ACH or acetylcholine. So there's a whole bunch of acetylcholine inside each of those vesicles. And what happens is when we have a, an action potential which moves down the neuron, it triggers the release of these vesicles and the release of acetylcholine in this synaptic cleft. Now, acetylcholine, when it's moving into this synaptic cleft, it will eventually find a receptor on the cell membrane of this muscle fiber. And these are acetylcholine receptors. And so what we get is this acetylcholine complex. Acetylcholine will bind to the receptor, and then this will cause a depolarization of the membrane, but ultimately, it will create an action potential. And so this action potential will then move all down the membrane of the muscle. Now, if you recall, um, there's small openings to uh, every so often down, the, 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 um, down a muscle fiber and they allow an entrance into the muscle fiber. Do you remember what these are called? They're called T-tubules. So these T-tubules will propagate this action potential deep inside the muscle. Now, the other structure that you need to be aware of, it's called, see if you can guess, or see if you remember. It's called the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And so the T-tubules move the action potential down into the muscle, but then the sarcoplasmic reticulum, these structures kind of move along the individual myofibrils. And do you remember what's contained inside the, uh, the sarcoplasmic reticulum? If you said calcium, then you are correct. So the sarcoplasmic reticulum stores calcium, and upon uh, Upon the, um, an action potential moving down the T-tubules and stimulating the sarcoplasmic reticulum, calcium will be released into the sarcoplasm. Now, I'm gonna move this down just a little bit here so we can continue to draw. 
So remember that we're looking at an individual muscle fiber uh, right here. I'm gonna scroll back over here to put this into perspective. So we're looking at these things. These are individual muscle fibers. And then within these muscle fibers, they're myofibrils. There's a whole bunch of myofibrils. And inside these myofibrils, we have sarcomeres. And these are the individual proteins. So we're talking about actin. We're talking about tropomyosin and troponin. We're talking about myosin. All of those structures that we talked about in the, in the last video lecture. So let's go back over here and, uh, and, and, and show some of those structures. So now we're deep within the, uh, the muscle and we're focusing on those individual myofibrils. Now let's talk specifically about those, uh, what happens with those particular proteins. So uh, if you recall, there's a thin filament protein and it's called actin. So let's just draw that. So here's an example of a thin filament protein, actin. If you recall, there is another protein that wraps around actin and it is called tropomyosin. So it's kind of twirled and wrapped all the way around uh, actin. And then every once in a while, you've got these other proteins that sit on top of tropomyosin and they are called troponin. And of course, the, the thick filament protein in the muscle cell, it's called myosin. And that's what we want to draw right now. Myosin. So what happens is we have this calcium, which is released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And this calcium will move over inside the myofibril and then it will bind to, uh, to troponin. So here's an example of troponin. We'll get calcium binding to troponin. And what this does is it pulls away uh, the active binding site which tropomyosin is, is covering. And what happens when troponin and calcium pull away tropomyosin? Well, it allows a myosin cross bridge to form. It allows myosin to connect with actin. So how does this actually create movement? We've So far we've talked about how the, the action potential, it arrives, uh, it moves down the neuron, it arrives at the axon terminal, and acetylcholine is released into the synaptic cleft, which binds to a receptor, an acetylcholine receptor on the membrane of the, of the muscle, and that triggers an action potential which moves down the T tubules and into the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which releases calcium, and then calcium can bind to troponin, and then troponin can pull off tropomyosin from actin, and it exposes the binding site for myosin. So we've talked about how they connect, but how does this actually lead to movement? That's what we want to talk about next. Myosin is going to be pulling actin towards the center of the sarcomere. Each time myosin pulls on actin, that's referred to as the power stroke. So myosin will attach to the binding site, it will pull actin towards the center of the sarcomere, it will detach, rotate back around, and then attach to the next binding site, and pull it again, another power stroke. And it keeps on doing this until uh, actin reaches the center of the, uh, of, the, of the sarcomere, or until the calcium is gone, uh, pumped back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum, or until the action potentials stop. So I'd like to draw a little diagram again to show you kind of how this, how this works to try to conceptualize it uh, just, a, just a little bit. Okay, I'd like to just give you a little view on the interaction between these thin and thick filaments. And let's start by looking at myosin. And myosin is the thick filament with a globular head, which is what I'm drawing now. And now I'm just drawing actin. Now this is kind of a, 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 a gross oversimplification of these two proteins. For example, the actin that I've just drawn, uh, it, doesn't have, um, it doesn't have tropomyosin or troponin on it, so we're assuming that all of the active sites or, or all the binding sites are, are opened. So in this example, um, the myosin thick filament has not been bound to the actin. And this is really the first example. So the next thing that happens is 
Uh, for example, calcium is released and it interacts with troponin and pulls tropomyosin off and it exposes a binding site. So let's say this is the first binding site. Let's draw another little picture here. And this time we're going to be looking at myosin. It is reached down. And it has attached to that first binding site. And then the next thing that happens, the interaction, let's draw another of those myosin. Say that's that bonding site. So we're looking at myosin here in the globular head. The big thing that I want you to notice is the angle uh, that it is making with myosin. So right now, uh, the myosin globular head is not attached. It's sort of in an up position. Here, the myosin globular head, it's moved down to somewhere in the region of 90 degrees, so it's actually uh, making a connection with actin. And then the next thing that happens is the myosin globular head goes through a power stroke, and as a result of this movement, then actin slides. Uh, so myosin is actually pulling actin, and in this case, it's actually moving towards the center of the of the sarcomere. And then the next thing that happens, let's draw another picture with that myosin uh, globular head. Now we have the, the first binding site here, the second binding site here. Uh, and so actin has slid down, and now this myosin globular head is ready to bind to the next binding site. So it's this interaction with myosin and actin whereby the myosin globular head first, first reaches out and makes contact uh, with, uh, with the actin thin filament and then when it makes contact it performs a power stroke which causes actin to slide towards the center of the sarcomere and then it releases and then it makes contact with the, uh, the next active binding site on actin. And so it's this process, which keeps on repeating itself, that allows muscles to actually contract. Okay, there's one last thing that I'd like to show you uh, before we, we finish this video up. And it is how the sarcomere changes during contraction uh, and, uh, and relaxation. So let's first start by drawing a sarcomere. So make sure that we're all on the same page with that. There's a couple structures here that we really haven't mentioned last time. Um, this first structure, this is the center of the sarcomere, uh, and we're going to call that the M-line. Now, uh, the next structure that I want to draw, it's going to be a myosin thick filament. And remember, myosin, it's a thick filament, it's the big protein and it has all these globular heads that are attached to it. Now, I don't have time to draw a huge amount of detail, so let's just let these thick bars represent myosin because I think it'll give us still a good schematic of what a sarcomere looks like. And let's face it, I'm not the best artist anyway, but I hope you'll, you'll get what I'm, what I'm trying to do here. So what we're looking at is the center of a sarcomere and we're looking at the myosin thick filaments in the center of the sarcomere. The next thing that I'd like to draw is the actin thin filaments. And remember, these are going to be surrounding the myosin thick filaments, and they're going to be connected by structural proteins called Z-discs. And this whole component here is called the Z-line. And of course, we have all sorts of these structures and let's go over to the other side to give you a good idea of what the sarcomere looks like and remember the sarcomere is the smallest contractile unit in skeletal muscle it's really responsible for all of the contraction that we see in skeletal muscle and these things are lined in series um, over and over and over and over and over again through the muscle. So when they contract, they contract really, really fast. So again, we've got this Z line that this whole component here. So what we're looking at right here 
it is a sarcomere that is uh, not in a contracted state. So this could be an example of maybe when you have your arm reached out, maybe at the bottom of a, of a bicep curl. Or for example, maybe when someone is trying to arm bar you and your arm is totally stretched out. Okay, so this is the sarcomere in kind of the uncontracted state. Let's draw a sarcomere in more of a contracted state so you can see the difference. Now, again, let's be uh, really crude with our drawings. We're gonna draw the M line that goes down the center and now I'm drawing the myosin thick filaments. Okay, I hope you're with me here. Now, of course, we're going to draw all of the structures that we just drew, so next thing we're going to draw those actin thin filaments. And the thing to notice here is look how far in on those uh, myosin thick filaments they are. There's a lot of overlap here. That's what I want you to notice. Let's finish it off by drawing the thin filaments on the other side. And let's move over to the other side of the sarcomere, draw those thin filaments. And just notice how much overlap there is between actin and myosin. And let's continue to complete the sarcomere, otherwise my OCD would kill me. Now, what do we notice between this sarcomere and the, the sarcomere on the top here? Well, one thing we notice is we've got these Z discs. In the contracted state, they've shifted in, haven't they? Uh, just a little bit over here. So we've got this Z disc, and it's shifted in over here. And the other thing that I want you to notice is, look at the overlap, or lack of overlap, right here. And look at the overlap right here. What you're looking for is the difference and the distance between actin and the M line or the center of the sarcomere. It's pretty big there, right? Here, um, this is an example of a contracted muscle. So for example, maybe at the top of your bicep curl, uh, or maybe when you're covering up, someone's trying to smash your face in with a punch or something like that uh, in your bicep, you've got your, your muscle fully contracted. So there's not a big distance between this M line here uh, and, uh, and the actin thin filament. So I hope that um, by drawing these out you get an idea of what the sarcomere looks like, what some of the structures are in here, and maybe uh, what causes uh, these to contract. So that's really the ultimate point uh, of, of this video. Okay, let's summarize what we've learned in this video. First thing, we learned that muscles are activated by neurons, and neurons connect with muscle fibers to form what's called a motor unit. Big motor units cause a lot of force. Small motor units are important for uh, dexterity, but they don't produce as much force. Separate from that, we learned about this process called excitation-contraction coupling, and it describes the whole process whereby muscles can contract. It starts with action potentials in the brain, and then an action potential will move down the, from the brain, down the spinal cord, and then out towards the neurons, the alpha motor neurons. It'll move down that neuron all the way to the axon terminal, where there's acetylcholine. That action potential will cause the release of acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft, and acetylcholine will then bind in the synaptic cleft to receptors on the plasma lemma, or the muscle fiber membrane. The action potential will then move down that muscle fiber into the T-tubules and into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Remember, calcium is stored in the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and when, they, when it encounters that action potential, calcium will be released. And calcium will then move into the muscle fiber, move into those myofibrils, and it will bind to the protein troponin. And troponin is connected to tropomyosin. And together, when calcium binds to troponin, it will pull tropomyosin off of actin, and it will expose a binding site. Myosin is then free to bind to actin. And there's a whole bunch of detailed steps that describe how myosin reaches out and then grabs a hold of, of actin and then performs that power stroke and then rotates back. We gave you a pretty simplified version of that. Um, but in any case, that keeps on happening. Myosin keeps on attaching and detaching until 
there's no more calcium because it's pumped back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum or the action potential stops or uh, as we just saw the muscle shortens so much that actin is actually touching the M-line or the center of the sarcomere. So I hope you uh, I hope you followed this video. If you haven't, then feel free to watch it again. If you're looking for more articles or more information on the science of, of fighting, then please go to the website, themmatrainingbible.com. If you want to know more about what I do, then feel free to read the bio. Uh, separate from that, I hope you got something out of this video, and, and we'll see you next time.